Yeah, I'm Michael, uh, part of the Vast Experience channel, and uh, I'm going to be interviewing Samantha Moet. And am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. And I would actually just like her to uh, explain who she is and what she does. Well, I'm Samantha Mowat. I'm a clairvoyant psychic and a contactee. I've been a contactee my entire life, and I'm from a lineage where contact occurs on both sides of the family, on my mother's side, my father, for a lot of their siblings, their children. Going back multiple generations, I've been able to track at least four generations, and I can't go back further than that, purely based upon my grandparents never thought to ask their parents or their own grandparents if they were having contact because realistically the terms for contact change so it'd be very difficult to ask them but yeah mm -hmm. what would you like me to say michael well why don't we start with um your relationship with your parents and grand and um with their parents so that um kind of get a background of how you grew up and uh, how it was having contact within your homes. Oh, well, that's always a fun one. Um, I'm one of those very rare contactees in the sense that my mom and my dad are both really wonderful people. Um, when I was growing up, they, they were kind of nerdy in the sense, but because they had contact, of course, they gravitated to stuff like Star Wars and Star Trek, and they would say, you know, there's a lot of different types of beings out there, and we'd watch shows and they'd have greys, and they'd be like, I've seen beings like that, and it's okay. They're not necessarily bad. They're just, they have their own agendas, and it's like, okay. So it's been really great as I'm growing up to have my contact and be able to have my parents talk to me about their experiences and be able to share mine without that ridiculing judgment that so mm. many people get when they're going through these things. So that made it a little bit easier. Um, when It's kind of funny because when I was really little, we moved around a whole bunch with my parents being in the military. And so it didn't matter whether we've lived at one end of Canada or the other, contact always followed. And my parents were kind of funny because I'd have an ET encounter and I'd explain it to them, they'd be like, okay, that's fine, but you still have to go do your chores. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people think their parents would be like so sympathetic and understanding, and they are to an extent, but they never let me use it as a crutch either, mm. which has been really wonderful because it has kind of given me some coping mechanisms without turning to drugs and alcohol like so many people do, which mm -hmm. I'm really grateful for. So it's but, been a safe environment. Yeah. For you to discuss it at least. Mm -hmm. Which is wonderful. That, that, that might explain why you're comfortable yeah. talking in front of other people because you had that support. That's that's key. That was very key and that's very great. So mm -hmm. um, we'll keep going about that. <laughs> okay. So yeah. what I find really funny is when I was little, it was kind of weird when you're going through things like being taken out of windows or um, find yourself astral projecting or having these psychic experiences. And my parents, they are really wonderful people because instead of um, taking me to see um, like a church leader or anything like that to really uh, try to figure out my experiences, they bought a whole bunch of metaphysical books. They wow. bought these I know, right? Um, they bought these wonderful, I think it's Time and something, um, black hardcover books ranging from astral projection to um, understanding witchcrafts. I knew when, like a lot of my past life memories came forward quite wow. young, so I knew I'd been persecuted as a witch, so I was afraid of fire, I was afraid of drowning. And so to make me cope with those things, my mom put me in swimming lessons, and then she shipped me off forest firefighting. She's like, you're going to do this. You're getting over that fear. I'm like, I don't want to go. <laughs> That's pretty but, amazing. Yeah, it was fun. But um, because I was learning these things quite young and having school on craft going on, it really gave me a good foundation to understand the things that I was really passionate about. Although at the time, I couldn't really figure out how I could take these passions and turn them into a career because I thought I was pretty alone with this. I was in, I think, grade four or something like that. And I brought one of my parents' black books to school. And I think it was honestly the one about UFOs, which is really funny. And I got made fun of by the other kids for mm. <laughs> bringing a book about UFOs for show and tell. Right. So I learned at that point, maybe you don't talk to other people about it, maybe hold it in for a bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stuff like that happened quite a bit. And um, another thing I remember going through quite a bit was through school on craft. And so what a lot of people don't understand is when you go to school on craft, often it's not going to appear like um, like a standard classroom setting. We think of there being individual desks, and sometimes there are, but not very often. More often you'll find yourself in a room that's quite open with other children or humans um, and ETs or humans and ETs and hybrids or a combination of. And for a long time, I remember thinking, why am I seeing these really funny looking kids in my class? What's going on here? <laughs> but it wasn't 
because of the minor screen memories they put in place, I didn't really register that these were different dimensional, multidimensional beings. I thought, okay, well, maybe they're just my spirit guides or maybe they're angels. I hadn't really put that all together. And it, now when I look back at my diaries, I laugh so hard because I'm like, how did I not see the screen memory? This is adorable. But why don't you, uh, why yeah. don't you explain what a uh, screen memory is for those who don't know? Okay, so a screen memory is when you go through an extraterrestrial or multidimensional abduction or contact or experience, whatever you want to call it, often they will take you from your home, either physically or astrally, which is your soul coming out of your body, take you up onto craft, either do healing or teaching, and sometimes the appearance of these beings can be a little overwhelming for you. If you have an eight foot tall praying mantis being hovering over you with its eyes <laughs> looking into yours saying, I'm here to heal you, some people are going to freak out. And so they'll send the image into your mind of an angelic person or um, someone from your family or someone that you feel comforted by or familiar, which is great. And then they'll perform what they need to do and they'll send you back home and you'll be like, oh, I had a really weird dream last night. And I dreamt about my aunt and she was healing me. And so right. when we, yeah, when we look across the, um, the world at all the stories of all these wonderful healings going on, often different beings are accredited um, the work of other beings. And when you start looking at screen memories, it's kind of cute and kind of funny. But I can see why these beings are just grateful that everyone's getting taken care of. So mm -hmm. for years with my screen memories, um, often I would have the same beings presenting themselves to me as similar people. For instance, when I was younger and I was seeing my twin brother, Danny, who died in the womb, he decided not to incarnate. And so because he chose to, yeah, um, he chose to assist me from craft. And instead, I would come down here and he would act as like my counterpart. And so when he would come see me when I was little, he showed up as a little boy about my age from like two, three, four, five until I was about six, seven years old when we were moving across the country again. And when we were going to move, he said, hey, I'm not going to be seeing you for a while. And that was the last time I stopped seeing him as like a hybrid type being a boy with like really big eyes. And looking at that now, there's no way he would have shape-shifted to physically being in that form. So I now know it was a screen memory, but I'm okay with stuff like that because I see how they're doing it with loving intention. So would that be considered uh, a guide in, in a sort of way now? or Kind of. Um, just it's, in a way? Yeah, because a lot of the beings that are working with us on a telepathic level through claircognizance or sending people downloads of information are acting as spirit guides, but they're not necessarily the same thing as spirit guides. It's a bit of a gray zone trying to figure that out. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people aren't familiar. They've probably heard the term spirit guide, mm -hmm. but they can come in many forms and shapes, as I understand. Um, yeah. So why don't you go into some of your spirit guides and the interaction <laughs> with them? Okay, so I love my spirit guides. They're pretty funny. Um, the first two I met are named Michael and Sarah. Michael is Archangel Michael. He works heavily with me in this lifetime, which is great. He's the one who told me that it was okay for the extraterrestrials and multidimensionals to be presenting themselves to me in their true forms and that the majority of the ones that are coming to see me didn't have negative intentions. He did warn me about some of the ones who would have negative intentions, though, which is great. And for me to use discernment. Um, Sarah is, um, she's interesting because she's actually a ballerina, which sounds really funny to think, oh, well, why do you have an angel? And why do you have ETs? And why do you have ballerinas? Um, but the reason why, I know, um, the reason why she chooses that form is she's actually a multidimensional being that has incarnated on earth before and in the time period that she lived was in the period of Mozart and her occupation at that time was in ballet and that's part of why I have such a strong connection to dance and through self-expression in that form but um, she's here to help me more with my understanding of self and learning to better cope with being a human because a lot of star seeds don't do a good job of coping with it um, I do have some fairies that work with oh. me I think oh. I lost your picture. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. I lost I love There it. we go. There we go. Yay. We got it. Good job. <laughs> but um, so what's going on with the spirit guides and how they can be different is Phoebe. Um, this 
being that works for me, he's a bit of a variety of gray, but his head's kind of bulbous at the top. And he's one of my spirit guides as well. Same with the little tan being, same with Danny, my brother. He's acting as a spirit guide because when I'm having issues happening on my body, often he will come see me or he'll send me telepathic information of what I can do to fix them. And so we have a lot of different beings that work with us. But when people think about the term spirit guide, they tend to have it very limited. They think about um, just the humanoid type beings that are working with them. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Not seeing how Familiar. it's grander. Yeah. Yes. But it's kind of funny because one of my children has um, a Lyran being that works with her as her primary spirit guide rather than an angelic being. And so when I first met this being, I was a little confused going, why is there this tiger? Why is it a tiger half the time? Why is it a bipedal tiger? Because the memories about Lyra hadn't really come in really strong to me when she was a baby. And so I was a little bit confused going, what's this about? Right. So yeah, it was quite nice to get to meet the different beings. Right, right. So um. What are the type of be what are the types of beings that you may see most often or that come around the most, I guess? Um, lately it has been mostly humanoid, grays, hybrids, reptilians. Um, orbs are pretty common. <laughs> I know. It's it's a bit of a gambit. Um That's I do just have, lately. <laughs> yeah. I do have Andromedans come around a fair bit. Reptilians seem to they're not all good, they're not all bad, like any other race. But um it seems as though how can I explain this nicely? It depends upon what my vibration is doing as to who comes okay. around me and what is going on. And so when people think, oh, well, you've got reptilians coming around you, your vibration must be low. Well, no, a lot of these beings are very high vibrational, incredibly telepathic. Um, a lot of the ones are trying to also explain, hey, we're not all bad. Please don't judge us right. like that. And so even like you and I had talked about a few days ago, one of my more recent encount encounters in the last month and a half was where I was um, taken up onto craft and I was in a classroom-like setting with it being half reptilians, half humans, a mixture of male and female, and I had a reptilian, reptilian male beside me onto my right, a reptilian female in front of me to my left. And it's kind of interesting when you find yourself on craft being taught with these beings in a school like setting going, okay, I know we're here to learn because we're all facing the same direction and our attention's supposed to be over here and it's kind of like hazy on the outside. But you look at how these encounters with them go and it's so interesting because like even this year alone, I've met different types of reptilians. I've met some that had like clothing on them um, that were very bipedal. I've met velociraptors before. I've met ones that are um, like a six foot tall black reptilian who was there for, he's like a warrior cast. And then, but how can I explain this? Um, he didn't wear clothing, but he did have a tail to him that was quite thick. And he was um, moving me from one location to another. And they're so different than people are expecting. They think that they're all going to eat you. And some of them will. Please don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we can't necessarily judge these beings until we realize that they all have different vibrations. And you have to really trust that intuitive sense inside of you. Right. And I've gotten completely off topic. But um, <laughs> well, you're going in a, in a direction that yeah. I wanted to uh, move in. So Perfect. I've heard more and more stories mm -hmm. um, with other people and even on YouTube channels that there's quite a bit of reptilians that are trying to get away from their old factions and are trying mm -hmm. to move into a higher vibration and become a better being, right? Mm -hmm. So that saying where you don't judge a book by its cover it's extremely true with the beings out there i'm sure because they look all of them look different you know mm -hmm. way different than us most of them at least and well, it's I fascinating it is but i think people forget we may find some of these to be very unattractive looking but we don't take into account how they would perceive us they look at us going wow that's that's unfortunate mm -hmm. but i mean <laughs> it's the same thing everyone has their different <laughs> ideas of beauty Right. But I think it's really funny because I looked back into my journals. I was looking back into my childhood going, okay, well, what do I remember about these beings? And I remember when I was young, I had started to meet Velociraptor type beings. But in the majority of encounters I had with them in the 90s and into the early 2000s, they were chasing us. They weren't being kind to us. They were chasing us through the woods. And I couldn't figure out if this was like young my lab encounters or if this was a past life memory. It took me a long time trying to figure out what it was. And then when I met them in the last year or so, I had four female raptors come see me. And while well, they didn't come see me, they took me physically and three other women. Not fun, by the way, to find yourself naked on craft with other women going, what am I doing here? What's going on? 
Yeah, not so fun. And then seeing Velociraptor sitting in front of you going, oh, please tell me I'm not lunch. (laughs) (laughs) That was something that crossed my mind going, oh, no, who did I make mad? But that was not the case. As soon as I started feeling that, they sent me this loving energy. They said, hey, you're safe. It's okay. You're fine. Don't worry about this. And one of my guides piped in, so I knew this was a benevolent group, saying that they were interested in myself and these three other women because of our genetics and the fact we were ovulating at the time, and because we had the right level of activated DNA along with everything else with our body containers, so to speak. We didn't have diseases and pollutants and cancers and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, seeing, and then when I ran, because of course, I didn't listen. I'm a stubborn little monkey sometimes. And this one (laughs) followed me and she like she took me into a room that looked like it was the screen memory of my dad's house. And I should have known that I wasn't suddenly at my father's home and we're standing on the back deck and she comes up to me and I see the image of a being looking like my father and a being look like another member of my family. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm safe. And the being walks up towards my dad and my dad's not moving. And I realized that afterwards, this probably wasn't my dad. It's probably a being presenting itself as my dad. And it's saying, look, we're not going to hurt you. We just, you have a contract with us. It's okay. And so looking at that now, seeing how the relationship has changed, it's really made me reevaluate how I view some of these beings because it's not even that our initial thoughts are always completely right. But I mean, we all change timelines. They're changing timelines. We're all evolving. So we have to really take that into consideration too. What are you trying to think, Michael? Or what are you thinking? You're all blue. Oh, am I (laughs) (laughs) trying to say something? Is that the throat chakra you're talking about? Yeah. Figured so. So, uh, well, I, I had a lot of questions going through there, but um, mainly uh, you talked about contracts, and uh, I'd like to go into that a little bit, but also um, how many contracts are out there and what is the reasoning behind these contracts? So there are probably just as many types of contracts out there as there are thoughts in the universe. You could have a contract for any number of things. You could have contracts for hybridization. You could have contracts to spread knowledge. You could have contracts for abduction to, um, let's say, for instance, you could be someone who chooses to incarnate into a human body. Let's say, for instance, your soul is a gray. And you're like, well, you know, we can't abduct these people and find out this about them because you know the right. But if you incarnate into that human body, we'll abduct you from birth till death and we will check the pollution levels on the planet we will check the hormonal levels the psychological things you'll um, some people have contracts in place where they get abducted and the information that they see and hear and sense is then sent into devices so that it can be replayed for the ETs to see exactly from like a boots on the ground perspective so I mean there's a whole bunch of different contracts out there some of mine include things like um, helping to make psychic abilities more normalized helping to show the diversity of life in the universe in a way that's not threatening because it isn't my intention to be a fear monger Um, I don't really appreciate people who do that I understand it, but um, another one of my contracts obviously is hybridization. Another one is to act as a bit of an intermediary between humans and these beings. So it can be a little bit frustrating when you look at these contracts. Most soul contracts are done before you are born. I did make a contract in 2015 saying that I would help any being that feels it is being misrepresented in the human media because I was watching YouTube and I started bawling one day because someone was just ripping into the greys and saying that they were all bad and all evil and they're all demons. I'm like, I beg to differ. I've had these things heal me so many times and show kindness to me. And so I sent out that contract and lo and behold, I start having the floodgates open, having all these different beings saying that, hey, well, we don't feel like we're being represented clearly. And so if you start talking to them, It's important to have boundaries, which I didn't have at first. And so I've asked my guides and the beings I work with to act as kind of like legal counsel with the other beings of, hey, look, she's not going to have just anyone working with her because I don't want to open myself to possession. I don't want to open myself to um, a lot of the more heavy negative things that are going on. But, yeah, there's a lot that goes on with contracts. You can break them. 
if you, oh, you do can. have you can um you can i know my girlfriend misha johnston um starseedawakening.org she was able to break all of her contracts so if anyone listening to your program michael has contracts in place that they feel they'd like to get rid of i do recommend contacting misha and she could give you the tips and the tools to do that she broke her contracts with the um beings that she has because of the intensity of the my lab situation she was going through and some of her contact as well that's not something I choose to do, but I can understand her reasoning. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand that it can be quite hard for a lot of people out there going mm -hmm. through those types of situations and how confusing it must be and coming to grips with that sort of thing must be whew, <laughs> <laughs> difficult, right? It is. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of wanted to move into the area of what you're doing right now um, I, I believe you're in the midst of writing a book, maybe? Yes, right? that's right. Um, what's going on is I've had a lot of contact, and I keep asking them, can you help me remind, like, remind myself, remember, all of the contact I had that I've pushed away, what am I not remembering from my childhood, from my teenagehood? And just to give you a hint, this is what I've remembered so far. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> that's a four-inch binder. And wow. That's just going back to 2010-ish. So, you know, I've got about 25 more years to add on top of that. So, so it's mostly journaling in mm -hmm. there and that that's what you're going to present into the book and then kind of right. describe, are you going to do like beginning, middle, end sort of thing or just kind of <laughs> go through the stories or how do you well, think you're going to present it? Part of what I was thinking about doing as far as presentation is concerned is starting in 2014, catching up to the present, and then releasing stuff before 2014 in a different set of books. Um, the reason why I choose that year in particular is that is when I came out of the ET closet. And so I thought that would be the best one to really share. Um, when, I, when I look at everything, I don't want to push my opinion on people, but I would like for them to see it from what I experienced. And I have gotten better at recording with time, but when I look at things, I write down every detail I can remember um, from what I see, hear, smell, think, sense, you name it. And I want it to be a bit of a, um, almost like a research material for people. So that yes, it may say, okay, well it was January 1st, 2015. Um, I was at this location, it was astral, physical, psychic, and this was the being I encountered, and then stayed in the beginning all the way to the end about what it is I experience. Because for those who only want to learn about certain species, if they realize, hey, it's about a reptilian, I don't care about that, great, go ahead and skip it, go to the next one. Mm. If you just want to learn about Andromedans, Arcturians, great, here you go. And I was going to have them organized in there about alphabetical list for species, and then if you only want to learn about certain groups, whether it's humanoids and Palladians, and I was going to have it labeled as well, so they can only read those sections if that's what they prefer. That's pretty cool. Thanks. So, do, so um, why don't you give us uh, an example of uh, one of these stories that is in there uh, that you're planning on putting in at least? Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, bad. I don't even have my glasses on me. Okay. How about from um, memory then, if, uh, that if that serves well? Memory is pretty good for the most part. Okay, let me think. Oh, give me a species. That way I can think easier. Cause there's, I'm going through tens of my head trying to break it down. Uh, either Arcturian or Andromedan. You choose. Ooh. Okay, so one of my all-time favorite encounters that I share way too often is, <laughs> for example, it occurred in the spring of, I think, 2014. We lived in Mission, British Columbia. It was a physical encounter during the daytime and it was with an Andromedan being. I was carrying laundry from our main level, going up the stairs, going to my kids' room, so I just folded it. I put the laundry basket down on the bed, and I could see the sunlight streaming in through the window. And as I'm picking up shirts and hanging them in the closet, and of course I'm going like this over there, I look across the bed and there's this cute little um, Andromedan being physically standing there with this cute little brown head. It's oval shaped, it has a pointed chin, and he's up kind of like this, and I can see his black eyes. And as soon as I'm turning back, so of course you see them, but you're turning because you're in action. And um, and I look back, and of course I can't see him because he's kind of like ducked down. He physically ducked down. He didn't disappear. <laughs> and so I sent him this message of, I can see you. And I could feel this like radiating, giggly energy coming out of him. Because you have to look at it this way. If they deem you not to be a threat, if they know you're mentally stable, that you're not going to hurt them, these beings will come see you in the daytime. 
they will come see you when you're conscious, but you have to make it so that you're not going to go at it in such a way that's going to put you or them in danger. Because if I scream bloody murder and call 911, I mean, that's a <laughs> bit of a problem. Yeah, yeah I could so, see that. I mean, look at it this way. For a lot of these beings that are coming to see their star seeds, they don't want to scare them. So that's two steps. Yes, it's two steps forward and come to see them, but that's like four steps backward if the human's now scared of them. Because then it takes them six more months or six more years to move them forward again to that same place. It doesn't make sense. So they like to do mm. baby steps and how they acclimatize people to getting used to them. Yeah, I like mean, seeing UFOs first. For yeah. Instance. And then maybe getting telepathy <laughs> and moving <laughs> Having forward them from there. Getting closer. And then yeah. starting to see UFOs in your dreams and starting to see beings coming out of UFOs at a distance and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It is a gradual process. I mean, think of it this way. Um, another one that I talk about in this book is even some that I've had recently. Like, I just wrote this one down the other day, but um, I think it's August 17th, 2019. I was in Courtney, British Columbia. Um, it was a nighttime encounter. Well, actually, it's very early morning, but I call it a nighttime one, so astral encounter. Nope, pardon me, my guides just corrected me, not astral. They're saying physical because they're saying I didn't go anywhere. Thank you, guides. Um, oh. But what they're, they're showing me and what they had told me was I was laying in bed. I woke up. I could feel craft above the, like, my, my dad bought a camper trailer and we're camping out there because he had company over too. And I hear, like, I feel the vibration of craft. I kind of hear that humming sound that comes to craft. And I notice that my youngest gets up to go walk out of the trailer. I'm like, no, no, I'm like, you no no come here come to bed <laughs> you're not going anywhere i don't know who this is you're not going and so i honest i put up like energy protection on like our trailer that we're staying in and then i'm like okay i'm going back to sleep who goes back to sleep when they know there's craft above people yep. that are more programmed to doing it exactly and so i find myself um having this telepathic communication a few months later and i found it really interesting because when this is going on i kept having a series of images going through my third eye going through my physical eyes like and i'm seeing the image like it's coming in through here i'm seeing it my third eye but i'm starting to see it my real eyes and it's images of my memories of encounters that i've had in the past and this being is talking to me about what it was is that happened she was showing me an image of one of my hybrid children who's swaddled in a blanket after i gave birth to her and how she had this light skin and how she had very large black eyes and how she had eyelashes and I'm looking at her going oh she's so cute I was so mm -hmm. excited and I'm looking at the blanket I'm like why is she wrapped in a blanket and they're like she needs a blanket she's cold I'm like oh okay and then they're showing me other encounters that were happening and then this being was talking to me about um just about a few other things that happened some that are a little more uncomfortable to talk about sorry um so i've kind of omitted stuff like that anything that's really graphic and sexual i'm sorry i'm not going to detail my books about that that <laughs> that just seems way too uncomfortable for me to share that's just fair enough i'd say right i would think you're, so you're saying enough in the, in the first place right yeah but i mean um it's she was showing me how this baby was born she was showing me like where this baby was conceived and how that situation unfolded and then they're talking to me um explaining how this is a psychic communication how the ets when they're connecting with you will have the astral encounters where they take the soul out of the body have physical encounters where you're physically abducted and the psychic one because they're saying humanity is getting more psychic as a whole and as we're doing this they're trying to explain how they're starting to form psychic bridges or links with people to really send that information for those who are more i guess willing to have it come in so mm -hmm. it's really cool and I was super excited that she shared all this go ahead that's pretty interesting um yeah. and I bet humanity is becoming more and more psychic I, I'm noticing it with people in the groups that I'm a part of like I'm part of Dazen group and a lot yeah. of them are very psychic and mm -hmm. and like with the remote viewing I do that's almost all psychic work <laughs> for the most part, right? And yeah, it is. A lot of people are very talented at that and everyone can learn if they're willing, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, from from a day-to-day -day point of view or not even day-to-day, -day, just what do you do in uh, for work for yourself or, or for when you're working with people? I understand you do that mm -hmm. in some instances. Um, yeah, why don't, why don't we talk about that a little bit? Okay. 
Well, I work as a clairvoyant psychic because every time I try to go to university, they get me pregnant. So they told me I'm not allowed to go to school and go have a normal job. (laughs) I wish I was joking. Still not joking. Mm -hmm. Um, And every time I try, I'm like, why can't I go become an OBGYN? Why can't I become a dental hygienist? Why can't I go in for polycythe? They're like, no, we're not letting you do that. You have to do this. And so I understand the reasoning now. So what I do for a living is I do give people either psychic readings or which is telling them about their um, generally about where they're most likely going in the future based upon the choices that they're making at this time. Luckily, we're able to change that into being a more positive timeline if we make the good choices and follow our guide's advice. If you, for instance, when people are coming to see me, quite often they want to know about, okay, well, what is my life's purpose? What is it I've agreed to do? Um, what overall do I need to know? And the first thing the guides do is they'll show me someone's aura, and then they'll go into what kind of special traits this person has on a soul level, so skills and capabilities. Then they'll end up going to things like, okay, this is some of where they had their past lives, and over here is part of what we would like them to know, and here's who's working with them, and this is what their relationship, like romantic relationships, are focusing on. And because they're going to think about money, here's what we see for their financial situation in the next little bit. And normally it's looking at the next year or two. I don't like going five years in past because we're able to change that to such an extent that I don't find for most people that they stay as stagnant as they think they're going to be. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense, yeah. That's good. Um, The other thing I do is I help contactees and abductees who are going through um, really a difficult time with the awakening process and a difficult time handling their contact. Now, this is a little bit more challenging in the sense because I have worked um, exclusively one-on-one with some of my clients um, for months, if not almost a year, but in one case. But if you're working with me and you are having certain beings come to see me, and if your guides and the beings you work with, if I'm not feeling a good connection with them, I'm sorry, I will make the choice to not help you anymore. If they say I'm not the right person, I will let you go. And I do expect my clients to respect that. Right. Unfortunately, some people, they really latch onto you. So you have to have very strong and clear boundaries. Right, so that's right. the other hard part. I could see that being very, very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially... Um, since you're now, you know, you've become a, a figure online and, mm-hmm. you know, um, you have a lot of information and uh, people will find out, you know, stuff about you. And I can see that them, them, uh, you know, not all of them following boundaries in some, yeah. in some cases. Right. So that can be very important. I can see. Yeah, that's good. It is. It's important. But I mean, I'm not the only person who's able to do this. There's literally thousands of us who are in the same stage of awakening, if not surpassed us, who were able to help. And so I think people need to also trust their intuition. And if they feel drawn to multiple people, contact multiple people. It's mm. completely fine. I love it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you gave me a, a list of other people that uh, you thought I should interview and mm-hmm. that, that should you know, that shows a lot uh, that yeah. it, it's not just about you. It's about people learning as a whole. And I found that mm-hmm. very important um, Thanks. when looking at it as a whole. It's, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. So is there anything that you'd like to talk about um, that you'd like for people to know out there possibly or upcoming events or anything along that sort of nature? Well, there's a couple things that really stand out to me when I think about this aspect and this stuff. And the most important of which I think actually has to do with contact itself and the way that people don't realize not only the different ways in which you can be contacted, but how to use better discernment when you're experiencing contact so that you can know if on like more of a soul level, is this a being I can trust or is this someone that I need to be a little more apprehensive of? Because I think that's something that isn't really talked about a lot. And I think with a lot of the people currently in ufology, um, especially a lot of the bigger names, they're not really talking about how to use your discernment and your psychic abilities. They're looking at the mass collected data and assuming that, well, these people who I'm all friends with, they're all saying this, so we're all staying to the same story, which I think is actually detrimental for humanity and its growth and for our connecting of consciousness to the other beings out there. So... What I mean when I'm saying that is, let's say you meet somebody, 
And the, the reason why I bring up meeting someone physically rather than going straight into contact is I'll explain in a second. It's very applicable though. So let's say you meet somebody and whether it's meet them online or you meet them over a text message or you meet them face to face, doesn't matter. Right away, your auric field is picking up information about that other person. We all do it all the time. Sometimes someone will make us feel good and our aura expands and other times we feel like our aura is pulling back or it's wrapping around us. And when you're having those wrapping around feelings or those pullback feelings, it's your energy not resonating and connecting to their own. And generally it's because you're not on the same level. It doesn't mean one is better or worse. It simply means on an overall thought collective level, you're not necessarily meshing well. So you probably right. won't be good friends. And that means you probably have different priorities and different thoughts about um, how things should go. And so, mm -hmm. for instance, it can also tell you if you're in danger, if you get that like pull back and run feeling or that sinking feeling. And I've used that as quite a gauge in my encounters. I always pay attention to how I'm feeling more than anything, more so than what I'm seeing, hearing or anything else. How am I feeling? Is it being presenting itself to me as my aunt? Hmm. Yes, it is. Does it feel like my aunt? Well, my aura feels like it's pulling back and like it's pushing down. So, no, nope, probably not my aunt. Do I like this aunt? <laughs> no, I don't. So probably not a good choice. But, you know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And so they stop presenting themselves as people like her. And then someone would start presenting themselves as like my friends or my husband. And I'm like, you don't feel like you. And so when you're going through these encounters, if something doesn't quite feel right, like their face isn't maintaining shape right, or they're not speaking like how they normally speak, then know that it's probably an encounter if you're um, in your, like, you know, you went to bed and you find yourself either in a situation that you're not sure if you're on craft or not. Chances are if they're trying to, there are some beings that are kind of tricky. And when I say tricky, I mean self-serving. And it's not that they're necessarily a danger for us, but the energy coming from them is always swirling and moving. And it's almost like it's more of a manipulative energy. Mm. And the ones I found that are really bad for this, um, they appear to be a variety of humanoid and gray that are mixed together. Their skin can be similar to ours in the sense that it can go anywhere from light to dark to tan to whatever. But they tend to have very large black eyes, but the rest of their body looks quite human. Oh. And so, yeah, they wear clothes, but often they'll present themselves to me as people I know. And they're really bad for energy vampirism. And when you're going through things like love bite, they'll present themselves to you because they know you're going through a breeding program with other ones where you're actually having sex with some of these other people to make hybrids with them. They'll present themselves to you as that person. And then oh. rather than, yeah, for instance, um, let's call, give me a male name for a second, any male name. Matthew. Perfect. So this being, who isn't really Matthew, is now presenting itself to me as Matthew. And it knows that when I see Matthew on craft, Matthew and I have sex and we have contracts of hybrids. So it's now trying to um, entice me to have sex with it. And what it's doing is it's actually feeding off my auric system. And yet when I see this being before this even happens, I'll get that sense of my aura pulling back and yet feel like something's not quite right. And so that's why it's important to trust how you're feeling when you're going through these things, pay attention to your aura. And then when this is going on, um, I'll feel afterwards like I'm drained, like Matthew's not speaking to me, like we're not really connecting in the way that we normally do. And so that's where right. you're looking at people going through things like love bites and um, the hybridization encounters with like uh, people they're bonded and paired with having um, inconsistencies in what's going on with their physical um, abductions. Do you understand? I'm not sure if I explained that well. No, you did very good, very well with that, yeah. So, and the other thing you need to understand with these beings is when you're going up um, and you're being having like an encounter, if it's an astral encounter, you can still feel things in your aura. You can still feel if something is safe or not safe for you. Um, for instance, the first time I remember meeting Phoebe, it was really funny because I found myself in in an area that looked like my dad's house. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I was physically at my dad's house. And I'm, I think it's a physical encounter. I'm pretty sure at least. And I walked out into the, like the kitchen area and I found myself um, standing there. And then a moment later, someone says, oh, come outside. There's an orb floating around. And I should have realized it's a being telling me to open the door and come outside. <laughs> I didn't clue into that at the time. <laughs> so cute. And Tricky. so they are. They're so sweet. I, and I see this blue orb and it's like blue and it's gray. And it's got like this tail to it because it's slowing down. It's going throughout the garden and amongst the garden path. And I'm so excited. I'm like, I have to get my camera. Don't worry about your camera. And so, <laughs> of course, 
and there I go down. Go <laughs> I know, right? And I go down to the path, and this orb slows down. It starts to become this physical form. It um, goes into being Phoebe, showing how they can use different means of like um, contacting you, showing how they can be like physically um, brought down to a location, or go through orb travel technology. It's really interesting. I can't figure if it's like their soul becomes the orb, or if they come out of the orb. I haven't figured that out, but that's okay. And so when I saw Phoebe, my first response was love and joy, and I want to hug this being. I was so excited. And so right away, I knew that that being was safe for me. You have to really look at how you feel when you see them. And it's it's just, it's funny when you look at it. Hi, kitty. Oh, my, my God. My friend Jen's cat just came over and said hello. Oh, I love cats. <laughs> Adorable, isn't it? <laughs> oh, so cute. I don't know where mine is. Probably sleeping. Yeah, that's but, Pearl, right? Pearl, yeah. Oh, Pearl. hi, Pearl. But um, <laughs> when you're looking at this, I'm just going to like another extreme because we've covered how these, like the sexual energy that you can encounter and then versus a the really joy energy. Um, an example of, oh, one second, guys, it's a good one for that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, an example of where you could be a little bit um, thrown off with all this is when you're going okay um when i was really sick one time yep one second sorry they're talking to me i'm just trying to get them to be quiet <laughs> um anyways when i was really sick one time i had one of the reptilians show up to me and i wasn't quite sure how to perceive his energy because he has it when you encounter a being who doesn't necessarily have your best intentions at heart but also isn't meaning a threat to you you can get kind of like this chaotic neutral energy coming from them. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, where it feels like under different circumstances, they could be dangerous for you. And I remember when I saw him, um, I told him to go away because at the time I definitely didn't understand his energy well. And I didn't understand that that was his state of calm. I simply had him come into the room where I was and I felt like, okay, well, I don't know you. I don't trust you. I don't want you here. And so I put up energy protection and pushed him out of my space. Whereas um, this one time it, we were living at our last house and it was it was kind of intense because I woke up and I felt absolutely nothing. It like the energy felt like it was completely blank. It was completely clear. Like there was no strong read coming off of the plants or my husband or the kids. Everything kind of felt like it was just almost like it had a void of energy. And it was really scary for me because I looked and I didn't see our salt lamps on. I didn't see any of the night lights on, which was a bit of a like a red light for me because it's like we have we had small children at the time. And so you will always have night lights on in the hallway, in the bathroom, you name it. So you could see them at any point in the house. And I went up to like I got up out of bed and I went to flick the light up thinking, OK, well, the light's off. And I couldn't like the light wouldn't turn on. And I look and the fan's not on. And I remember looking in the windows thinking it was abnormally dark and almost to the point of being very, very scary. And then mm -hmm. a moment later, I felt something um, energetically, I guess energy just came into our living room, the hallway type area, because they were really side by side. And I felt like it was coming towards me. And I started to panic because I knew that whatever it is that was coming towards me, it was there for me because I tried to shake my husband and wake him up and he wouldn't wake up. And I tried to shake my German shepherd and she wouldn't wake up. And I knew that something had just gone off because if you have ET encounters, yes, sometimes they will put your family to sleep, put your pets to sleep. But normally if I shake them, they kind of like they groan or they'll like just be like annoyed. Whereas mm -hmm. I had no response from him mm -hmm. and I had none for my dog either. And so I remember my eyes starting to go black like this. And as this was happening, I had this anxiety, fear, and like whatever it was that was coming was very, very dangerous. Yeah. And when you have stuff like this occurring, you have to really pay attention because I knew whatever it was that was coming did not have my best intentions at heart. I knew that it was something that was malevolent towards me. And so you have to really trust that intuitive knowing that we all have. We are all psychic. We are all at least clairsentient, the ability to pick up the minor threads of energy. We may not all be empathic to the point that we can really sympathize and understand from the perspective of the energy coming at us, but we can all at least read the energy. And mm -hmm. I wish that was something better discussed in ufology, the mm -hmm. how to better access and understand what's coming towards us. So... Uh after having something kind of scary like that happening, mm -hmm. how do you go about um, trying to normalize that and bring it into your everyday life? Because that's, 
you know, something's got to be traumatizing or at least very difficult to deal with. Uh, so how, how do you go about um, helping yeah. with that? Or Well, I do have PTSD. I'm well aware of that. Um, how I best deal with all this is I do yoga. I work out a few times a week, at least typically four times. Um, I do meditate every day. I don't do any drugs. I drink very little alcohol because I see how that could be a very slippery slope. And it's just not worth it for people like me. It's If you do start drinking, it would be the end of you because all, all of your um, lower vibrational emotions will come up to the surface because you'll cut yourself off from those higher vibrational energies. Mm -hmm. um, it does help to find a, like a support group or a peer group. And <laughs> just going to plug Misha in again. Um, I love Misha's group because <laughs> Misha Johnston does have amazing ones for um, contactees, my labs, experiencers, super soldiers, depending upon what you're going through. it You do need other people like you to talk to because you can't, even though my family has had contact, the degree of contact that they had is not even close to the degree of contact I've had. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean that in a way of it wasn't their life's purpose. It wasn't their soul agreement. So they did not need to have it. They were simply, in a lot of cases, the vessels that needed to bring the next generations forward. And so they would have the usual contact of childhood contact, modification, teenagehood, um, pairing with the person who would be the right genetic match, and then breaking off the relationship. And that's totally fine. But for people who are going through this, the reason why I recommend working out, which I know we say working out and people are like, oh, I hate working out. I don't want to do it. It doesn't have to be bad. I mean, I personally love running. I love going to karate. You don't have to go to a gym if you don't want to. Yeah, so yeah, find that thing. That's nice. Yeah. We're just going for walks in nature. That Getting works. grounded that way works great. I, I go for several walks a week. And nice there's nothing like it no. you know it it uh, gets it gets you grounded as i said and gets you feeling like you're back in nature like it it's it's awesome anyways i, I love going out there and <laughs> me too um, uh so one, one of your contracts i assume mm -hmm. is to talk to people and mm -hmm. to get the word out for a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. um and was that contract made prior to coming to this yes. life so it would have been before like a soul to soul agreement kind of thing is that usually so, how it works kind of um when we look at soul contracts and how they work for some of the people okay um i'm just gonna explain a little bit more about this so for some of the people that i go through hybridization with some of the men that I have love bites with, we have contracts in place between he and I who like that we will get together um, on craft and we will have children. Not that he and I will have a relationship in this lifetime, which is really funny when you meet these people in person and you're like, I know you. Oh my God, that's how I know you. <laughs> it's, it can be really bad. And sometimes it takes you like days, weeks, months to figure it out. I knew one of my friends, oh God, I think I knew him for about six months before I started realizing that he and I had hybrids together and I went, beat red for a while every time I saw him realizing how often this gentleman I had made children I'm like oh my goodness did he, did he realize it or yeah did it he realized it oh he did yeah and so yeah, I was sort of like why weird. yeah we couldn't make eye contact for a while I'm like huh what's this about <laughs> mm. so I mean you do have contracts like that but um some of the other contracts it depends because you can make contracts in previous incarnations that can still impact you today. So when we look at soul contracts, if you make contracts like um, or vows or oaths or fealties in the Middle Ages, let's say you're a nun, let's say you're a knight, that you will now serve and protect this order or serve and protect this, then those contracts can still impact you today. Whereas when I look at the ET contracts that I have, they show me that I've been abducted for multiple lifetimes going back hundreds if not thousands of years. And so for me, going through contact, like contact, is something I'm very accustomed to, even on a soul level as a child. Like my earliest contact experience, being being very sick, being coming in, healing my lungs, and not freaking out even when I'm being taken out of a window when I'm five or through the ceiling, um, all throughout elementary school, going up into craft. It's because that's something we are familiar with, something that we've had thousands of times. It's no different than um, really going in a car or anything like that, and mm -hmm. so. It, it can be a little bit difficult to explain to people, I think. 
The harder contracts are ones I think where um, star seeds, in particular, like yourself and like mine or myself, um, who agree to have star seed children, and then having yourself go through contact and having contracts to raise these little star seeds, and those little star seeds having their own contact, and then realize like getting to know the different beings that work through them, even if you don't necessarily have a contract with their beings, um, having new contracts kind of coming into place. Originally, when I incarnated into this lifetime, I made the agreement to have three children. And so, obviously, the first two spots are filled. But now I've got, like, a bunch of different hybrids saying, hey, I'll be that one. I'll be that one. I'm like, whoa, guys, no. <laughs> and because I kind of left before I came into this body, um, that third vacancy, it wasn't just set, it will be you. Whereas the first two were set, you and you. And so, that's part of why I have so much hybridization. Go ahead. So, so you... Um... Yeah. Did orbs come in, or do you have dreams about souls that yeah. are trying to really? That's that's <laughs> fascinating. That's fascinating. It's fun. Well, so, that, before, so that's two come. Well, that's I have one more to come. come. Yeah, he's wow. a brat, by the way. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so you already know which one it is. <laughs> well, if it's the one who I think is coming, because I've had, um, it's kind of funny. I have this one little gray child who has shown me giving birth to him a good half a dozen times now. He is so stubborn, <laughs> so bad. He showed me our last house, me giving birth in the kitchen. We And then we moved out of that house and he bought this house. And he showed me me giving birth in this kitchen. Like, I am not giving birth in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he showed me like our next vehicle. And as soon as I walked into both those houses, I was like, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> No, Recognized. no, that means I didn't actually choose this house. That means that was already decided. <laughs> yeah. But here's the tricky part. You can have contracts to have these children. But if you make the choice, if let's say you and your spouse decide, hey, we want to stop at two kids. We're not having a third kid. They are going to try to switch out your partner and put a different one in. Wow. And they will do that. And that's something that's not really talked about a lot, especially if you have contracts for hybridization. And like for the instance with my husband and I, we decided after our second was born, our second had a ton of allergies. And we're like, we don't want any more babies. We're done. And so there's only so much crying you can take until we modify the diet, obviously. And then because we did that, it was within, I think we had just made the decision. We hadn't even gone forward with the like vasectomy. Sorry, hon. I know you're not going to be happy with me for saying that. Um, but because we had made that decision, I started having ETs coming in place talking about, okay, well, you have a soul contract with this gentleman and he currently has two children and you guys could have one or two more. I'm like, no, I'm not leaving my marriage. And so um, I think I've had a good half a dozen up until this point where I've met different men on craft and then physically came to met them in person who I had these soul connections with, who these beings are like, okay, well, you can still have really good children, earth children, because they're trying to get all the um, star seeds to incarnate down here. They're trying to get right. um, more of that energy raised. And so when you make the choice not to have these kids, it changes your soul contract around a bit because he and I technically are violating our contract. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. There's a lot to that. At that age. <laughs> like, well, I guess looking at it from a human perspective, it mm -hmm. seems like there's a lot to it, but on a vibrational level or from what they see, it's very simple, set forward <laughs> in a line, I bet, and much easier. Yeah. But uh, I, can, I can't imagine uh, how complicated it can be in trying to keep it all together. That's why you have your book there and why yeah. you can write those things down, trying well, to keep it set. You and, can't really see them, but I've got about 20 journals behind me. <laughs> Really? Oh, wow. Oh, one sec. Oops. Happy Crystal. <laughs> There's a lot of journals. These are just the more recent ones from like 20, 2008 onwards. They're all full. Wow. So, oh, no yeah, yeah I've, I got, I've got a few, but they're, they're mostly just, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I gotcha. So, yeah. So, um, with, um, with mm -hmm. people that you work with that, uh, so they, uh, would I say they hire you to work with them on a one-to-one -one level or like, do they do mm -hmm. Skype session? Do you do Skype sessions with people or is it, how, do. how do you do it? Yeah. I prefer the phone over Skype just because normally when I talk to people's guides, my eyes are closed and I just prefer to see them on more of a clairvoyant level. Whereas if I'm looking at someone, I tend to get distracted if you and I are talking and then they chirp in, like chirp in and I'm like, okay, just wait one sec. And then I always make these really <laughs> funny faces and I don't like people seeing me make them. <laughs> So, Fair enough. you know, mm -hmm. that little tidbit. But so for me, I do most of my sessions over the phone and I just find it to be so much easier for me at least. So. Right, right. Yeah, I I've been, uh, 
oh, uh, I've been using Skype with a friend when my yes. internet was working yes. and um, <laughs> over Skype. And mm -hmm. I would just, we both click off the visual part and just use it as a phone. It would be a lot, mm -hmm. a much clearer audio of course. that way. But And yeah. that I totally love. I'm totally willing to do that. Sorry. <clears throat> They gave me something to drink last week um, in an encounter, and my throat has been off ever since, but that's okay. Oh, what, what happened with that? With well, the encounter? well, I found myself on craft, and they gave me this. I, it's kind of funny because it was presenting itself to me as um, a drink, and I thought for some reason it's, it was like a short glass, like that big, and it had like this white liquid in it. And I found myself feeling like I was kind of drunk or kind of almost like um, inebriated. And so mm. I was like, how much of this have I drank? I can't do this. I have to drive home. You can't have me do this. <laughs> I'm like, take this away from me. Get me a cup of tea. They never brought me my cup of tea. I was so mad. <laughs> of course. And I remember like just the next day my throat felt weird. I'm like, oh, it's because that encounter, I guarantee it. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what it was? Like mm -hmm. what, uh, what do you think it might have been for? For your immune system or something or? Mm -hmm. It could very well be because we are approaching cold and flu season. Um, I know I do have more delicacies with the lungs just with being a twin. That like It seems like my lungs aren't really as perfect as they could be. So that tends to be the area they heal me most often. That really? or something related to fertility. Did you say you're a twin? Yeah. Oh, my mother's a twin as well. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I was, we high-fived every time we had an ultrasound. It wasn't twins. Like, yes, not twins. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah. usually when uh, twins have kids, usually their kids will that have twins, twins right? Usually, yeah. Well, not usually, but that seems to be the case. It runs in families or um, grandkids of families, you know, how, however it works. So um, this interview has gone very well. I'm very happy of how, how it's all gone so far. Um, <laughs> Me too. Uh, would you like to talk about um, uh, your website or how people can get a hold of you um, if sure. you're still taking customers or <laughs> whatever you want to call them, <laughs> clients? That's funny. Either works. Um, my website is www.samanthamoet.ca. It's probably easiest to just text me. I have... Oh God. So my email wasn't syncing onto my computer or my phone for my website. So I've got about a thousand emails right there. I'm still in the process of responding to, Ooh. and I've started at the bottom. So if you call, contact me now, I'll private email you back in about four months. Oh wow. And my phone, which I live on, I don't often check my email on my computer, wasn't syncing with my phone. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to get back to the 400 something that's left on there. Well, so I can text try to... me. I, I can try to help yeah. you uh, sort that out, and I'll, I'll uh, yeah. try to find a way to put the information on the screen or whatever, whatever will work for it. And uh, it's all good. Um, Whoever's meant there. to find me always does, so I'm not mm -hmm. worried. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I had a lot of fun. It's been entertaining. And if yeah. you want, we have like 25 more minutes. Totally your call. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we'll end the interview mm -hmm. there, but we'll keep talking. So sounds um, like fun. I'd like to say to everyone, thanks for uh, watching the vast experience and um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it was my pleasure. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>